So we're looking at John Keats uh, today and uh, some of his famous odes. Uh, his spring odes. Let me talk a little bit about John Keats the man first and then I'll, I'll come to the poems uh, because I think we at least need to know something about Keats if only the fact that he is in the second generation of romantic poets. We looked at William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge as first generation romantics. Uh, we didn't get to William Blake, he was on the syllabus, but we didn't get to him because we'd had, of course, we had material drop out. Um, but they're considered first generation romantics. <laughs> and then the, the next generation comes along after them and they live, <laughs> to say, you can see Keats is born in 1795 and dies in 1821. Uh, uh, but the lyrical ballads were written in 1798, so three years after Keats was born. So that's the, there's a generation gap there. And the basic difference between the first and the second generation is the second generation has read the writing of the first generation and is responding to it. I would also say that uh, the first generation uh, starts off fairly radical and sympathetic to the aims of the French Revolution when they start out. And then when the horrors of the French Revolution become known, <coughs> specifically the reign of terror, when they start executing the leaders of the revolution, uh, when the revolutionaries execute their own leaders, having executed the king, uh, and uh, anarchy is threatening the Wordsworth and Coleridge, at any rate, reconsider and become more conservative in their thinking and uh, in their politics and even in their, their writing. And the second generation is sympathetic with their early work and not with their conservative move. So Coleridge, whom we looked at when he writes Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, uh, this was him in his early days. And, uh, and as I say, at that time, a Unitarian, I think, and had not yet made uh, his move towards uh, Christian convictions. That comes later. But the second generation regarded Wordsworth and Coleridge as sellouts for that, and uh, write explicitly on that note. And they are true believers in the aims of the uh, not only the political movement, but the literary movement started by the, the first generation. So they have certain common themes with them. So one of them is they, they have a strong belief in the power of the imagination. That they all share in common, the romantic poets. Um, they're also interested in uh, uh, originality and in, in uh, breaking with conventions of neoclassicism and so forth. And in some of the poems we're going to look at today, we'll see that both of them are about art, the right relation between art and nature. Actually, that both poems, the Ode to a Nightingale and Ode on a Grecian Urn, uh, among other things, are probably primarily about the role of art, the right relation between art and nature. It's a topic I've spoken of already a few times in different ways. And, um, and they do adhere to the romantic view on it. And so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in conjunction with the poems. But that is worthy of note um, about Keats is that he's in the second generation. Also that he was a trainee um, surgeon. Now surgeons in that day were not, uh, didn't do medical training, they chopped off limbs. That's what surgeons do, which is a grisly business without anesthetics. So he was a medical, he'd been around that um, stuff for a significant period of time. He'd seen a lot of death. And furthermore, he uh, experienced a fair bit of it insofar as uh, those ne many near and dear to him uh, suffered from tuberculosis and died from it. And Keats himself contracted tuberculosis and died from it. And when he wrote the Spring Odes, which two of which we're going to look at today, uh, he may have known that he had 
TV. It's quite possible. And if it's not that he has it, he's certainly meditating on death as well. Poetic fame, art and nature, mortality versus immortality, the possibility of art to preserve a person's immortality, so we still speak of the fame of Shakespeare and Homer and those authors, and their fame lies in their work, so it's a legacy of their mind. Keats is very much wanting to be a great poet, so that's part of his discussion as well. But, but he was probably aware the, of the fact that he had tuberculosis, and if not, uh, his brother had died from it. And, uh, and so he was very much thinking about it and worried about dying before he had achieved poetic fame. And he was convinced that he was a great poet, and I think he was correct. They are both odes, so let me say a little bit about the ode as a form. I don't think we, yes, we did the immortality ode. So romantic poets start writing odes. Why do they write odes and what is an ode? Well, it's a literary foam form dedicated to something meditative and stately and solemn So they can be composed on um, various occasions. There, all, there are a variety of different types of odes. There's Sapphic odes and Alcaic odes and Pindaric odes and Horatian odes, and they have various, there, so there are different types of odes written in the ancient world. The one that comes to prominence, which is the ones that, that Keats is writing, are Pindaric odes. After the Greek poet Pindar, and Pindar was known for his um, celebrating things like the Olympian Games and so forth. The reason Keats is writing that is because Pindar becomes strongly associated with the sublime. The Pindaric Ode is seen to have uh, more powerfully, emotionally expressive and uh, capable of expressing the sublime, and so romantic poets tend to write Pindaric odes, as opposed to <coughs> Horace, who is writing something more of a classical ode. And uh, it was thought that Pindar's odes did not have any particular form, they were more natural. So there's a strong bias in the romantic period about natural, getting, expressing things naturally as opposed to artificially. And we can see that in the poetics. There's, they're throwing off artifice and the conventions of neoclassicism, and, and their po poetry uh, claims to be about nature and to be expressed more naturally. So Wordsworth, in his writing on the, uh, his preface to Lyrical Ballads, he says that that is exactly what poetry aims to do. And in fact, in fact this is Wordsworth's quote, not Keats. And I think I wrote this on the board before. All Good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling. Direct quote. And we get that powerful feeling in conjunction with the presence of the objects of nature. So our, we have natural objects, our feelings develop in the conjunction with nature, and they express themselves naturally, not through poetic conventions, not through artificial uh, genres, but, but naturally. So there's a uh, stylistic effect of this, and it's common speech in Wordsworth. It's more, and it's getting rid of the, the heroes are no longer aristocrats or knights or people that are in uh, a certain uh, station in life. They tend to be common uh, figures. Yes? If their real goal is to kind of get rid of a structure why were they choosing like meter and poetry over like visual art or something? Like if that was their true intention. It's a, it's a good it's a good question and it's one that well the the romantic movement and its aim to get closer to nature is, doesn't go away. It's the beginning of a movement that is still we're still with. But um, I think it's because they are not that far away from uh, classical conventions. 
So if you want to express something and to be known for originality, you have to do it in comparison with something that's gone before. It's ironic in some sense, but you can't know that something is original if you didn't know anything else. Like if you had no acquaintance with anything before and they, you could not actually even say that that was an original poem. Because you wouldn't know any other, of course it's original. If it's the first poem you've ever read, then it's original, right? Okay, but you may as well say it's conventional then. And you wouldn't know the difference one way or the other. They've read enough poetry. So they are, their claim of originality comes against the backdrop of a knowledge of the, liter the literary tradition. And the ode is a form expressing natural sublimity. But again, it's going to juxtapose that with an understanding of, of art and their predecessors as writers. So they have read, <coughs> uh, Keats reads Homer and writes poems about Homer and uh, reads Shakespeare and reads Milton they, and reads Dante and is very much influenced by, the, by those poets. So the claim of originality isn't from nowhere, it's against those writers. Now, on the subject matter being common day things, this is really interesting if you think about it. Uh, so I said that the heroes of traditional classical literature tend to be uh, princes and kings and nobles and knights and aristocrats and uh, supernatural beings in some ways, demigods. But if you look at the Gospels, it's the common life that is in some ways being held up as an example. It's, so the heroes of the, the Gospel, well, Jesus himself is one. He's the son of a carpenter. He comes from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? As his opponents ask. Uh, he is not uh, he is a king, but he doesn't look like a king. He claims so. There's a there's a in some day in some ways an exaltation of the common life that's in the Christian faith, right? So it's already there, and the and so romanticism in some sense is moving closer towards Christianity insofar as it recognizes the goodness of common day life and how it can be heroic, and it connects a spiritual significance to it. So that's so. There's a, in some ways, a strong connection between Romanticism and the spirit of Christianity. On the other hand, and this is the thing I've already emphasized, they collapse God with the world. God is in nature, which is not a anything like a Christian emphasis. It's the contradiction of it. But anyway, with all, with all those things said, uh, let's look at a couple of the poems. These were the essay topics. I'll try. Uh, I want to look at Ode to a Nightingale first of all. Now, let me say something about the Nightingale. So this is written May 1st, 1819. These were a uh, collection of poems or written in a time period very close uh, to one another called the Spring Odes. Ode to Psyche, Ode to a Nightingale, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode to Autumn, those sorts of things. But uh, this one's Ode to a Nightingale. And a Nightingale, uh, we don't have nightingales in Canada, I don't think. It, it's, it's a songbird. Do we have nightingales here? I don't think so. Maybe we have birds similar to it. We have songbirds, for sure. And, but the songbirds that sing at night, and a night, nightingale does sing at night. It makes a particularly haunting, beautiful song, but they sing at night. You can't see them. Oh, yes. The other thing about an ode, an ode literally means a song. So a song to a nightingale, which is a creature who sings, it's a natural creature. Also a symbol for the poet. Milton uses the nightingale as a representation of the artist in, uh, I think, his poem Lycidas. And I think Shakespeare does as well. So it's a relatively common figure for the poet. So this is directed to a nightingale who is an artist of sort, a natural artist, a creator of great beauty, who sings at night in the dark where he can't see it. Let me read this, and uh, then we'll comment. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we will comment on it. So, my heart aches 
and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and leith words had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green, and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the flushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever and the fret here where men sit and hear each other groan where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus, and his parts, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through virtuous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet. Now what soft incense hangs upon the, on the, bo the boughs, but in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit free, free tree wild, white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading, fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. Darkling, I listen, and for many a time have I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many amused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet bat breath. Now, more than ever, seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations trod thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Thus concludes the poem. So it is an ode to a nightingale. You can see that there's a... Um, between the stanzas of which they're not enumerated here, there are eight, um, which is almost marks it as a Pindaric ode. Pindaric odes tend to be 
lengthy. But here you can see that the subject matter is hardly heroic. There's not a celebration per se. It's the form rather than the content that marks it as a Pindaric ode, I would say. And there is some regularity to it, having said that. So I was asked about the meter or and the rhyme. You can hear a regular meter. You can also see the rhyme in it. So pains and drunk and drains and sunk. If we were to just mark this up a little bit. Pains would be the A and the drunk would be the B and the drains would be the A and the sunk would be the B. And the lot would be a C because we haven't had it yet and happiness would be a D and the trees would rot, would count as a rhyme with that, and plot would go with C, and then numberless and E's would also count as rhymes. But they would be uh, D, I guess you could say E, okay, D, E. So it may sound like, it may seem like he's wandering in his thoughts, but it's clearly got a rhyme scheme to it. And it also has a regular meter. You can hear the cadences when I, when I read it, I think. I won't take the time to mark up the meter. I do that in the practical criticism course. This is a second year class. Um, but it clearly has a, a structure to it. And we'll find that that structure uh, persists throughout the poem. So those are how many lines there? 10. Uh, not all of the stanzas are exactly the same in their rhyme scheme, but I think they're all 10 line stanzas. So pretty regular. Unusual for then a, a Pindaric ode, where it doesn't have that regularity. But it's sung to the nightingale, and again the nightingale is a figure of creativity or poetry, and yet his, uh, when he begins the poem he does it in a state, state of distress. <coughs> Existential angst use a later phrase, it's not when they even existed back then. <laughs> and he, he references uh, this drowsy numbness that pains a sense as though hemlock I drunk. Hemlock, do you know the reference to hemlock, what hemlock does? It kills you. It kills berries. It will if you drink some amount. Sure, mm -hmm. it was what killed Socrates actually. They forced mm -hmm. him to drink hemlock. So it's poison. So he's, it's as if he's been poisoned. He's dying. And this reference to death uh, persists throughout the poem. It will be in this poem and the, the companion poem, the Ode on the Grecian Urn, that we'll look at next as well. Meditation on mortality and death. And in fact, this is one of the things about the nightingale that he envies. It's the fact that the nightingale seems to be aware or be unaware of the problem of death. It's not troubled by death. He is. It sings it's cheerful, and it not only sings and is cheerful, birds like it have sung him in cheerful throughout human history. And there's an, almost a, a lack of self-awareness in the song of the creature, the nightingale, which which he envies. It's not, it doesn't have a self-consciousness. It's not troubled by its mortality, whereas for him, death is a terrible thing. An opiate is something you drink, you uh, would take to uh, dull pain, like opium. And drunk it down to the drains, right to the bottom, one minute past, and Leith words had sunk as if he sunk to. Lethe is the, the river in the underworld where the souls go after they've been there for a thousand worlds, years to forget their identity. They're dipped into that and they are reincarnated and they get put back in bodies. So the souls go down in the underworld, they're punished, in, at least in Plato's reckoning. Uh, and they, they are having lost their identity are then reincarnated.
so what it says, it says something about their understanding of the, the soul and the body. So the soul is the true you, but the true you can also be made into a blank slate. The slate can be wiped clean and then it can be put it back into a body and the conditions of bodiliness give you uh, pain and suffering but also prejudices and that constitutes your identity and then you get rid of that again. But this, but he begins with that, and note the use of the uh, full, uh, the colon at the uh, end of line four. It it what comes after is clarifying what had come before in some way, and in this case, it's to explain. It's explanatory. It is not through envy. So he's not pained by envy but rather by being too happy in thine happiness. How is this not envy? He says it's not envious. Other than that, he's too happy in your happiness. Well, then why is he pained? Where's the pain come from? If he's happy at its happiness, where would the pain come from? It's upon, reflect upon himself and not reflecting upon it. So it's a self-conscious poem. It's about himself. Because otherwise it makes no sense. If he's brought to a sense of pain by listening to the nightingale, you would have thought it was because he wishes that he were like the nightingale. But it's not quite that. It's more that he thinks about himself. And that's the problem. Is that what you're going to say? Or, no. I think it's just that I read that as I'm not envious that you're happy. I'm envious that you're too happy. Oh. So, that's interesting. It's not because of envy of your happiness, but that you are too happy in your happiness. That's more or less, It's. I think it ends up, that's an interesting way of reading it. You understand? Yeah. It has the same effect. Your happiness is undisturbed by trouble. It's totally, there's no sense of remorse. It's not tinged by darkness. It's just pure happiness. Yes, that might be it. It's not that I'm envious of your happiness. It's that I'm envious that your happiness has no shadow fall over it like mine does. The shadow that comes with knowing that I'm going to die and that bothers me, it doesn't bother you at all. It's the same thing. But yes, good, good. Yes, I think fair enough. <laughs> and then he moves from that, so he begins with thinking of drinking of hemlock or some opiate, and then he moves on to wine. A draft of vintage, cooled in the earth, tasting of the regions from which it's come, Provençal, area of France or the warm south, Italy, Greece, who knows, the blushful hippocrine. That, but in the, the effect is the same, that he may drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. The same, he's drinking himself out of existence to forget. Many people drink for that reason. You can drink and take joy in it. You can also drink to annihilate your sense of yourself to yourself, to dull it, the pain. In the latter case, that's the uh, rationale of the addict. Running from a problem. What is the problem for him? Well, we're going to come to that. But he wants to fade away. So note that the, uh, the song he hears is connected with various other senses. One is the song, but the other is then the taste. And then he's going to move on, and, and, and throughout he is getting rid of the sense of sight. The sense of sight is something that he is um, 
obliterating in some ways because he wants to fade away. He wants to go into the dark. He wants to fade into the forest dim. Comment or question? I don't know. I have a different edition here, that's all. Why would he be wanting to fade out his sense of sight if what his problem is is that he's doing this song? Because he wants to be a great poet. And to fade away entirely would just be to die. He doesn't just want to die, he wants to be immortal and yet to lose the sense of mortality. Mm. He wants to be immortal like, and he, uh, the uh, channel of beauty in some ways through his, through his own song, because it's, an, it's another song, this is the song to the songbird. Um, yeah, so there's a contradiction there, yeah. He doesn't totally want to disappear. He just wants the mortal side and the conscious side of himself to disappear. He wants to become like the songbird, unaware of his mortality. But he can't do that. This is his problem. He's going to find the same problem in the Ode on the Grecian Urn. It represents an immortal song that goes is heard throughout all generations, and it sounds the same, and it's always cheerful, and it's never marked by sadness. Even though the birds die. They're not troubled by their mortality, whereas he is, and he can't help but be. So I talked about the, the sense of the collapse of the na natural and the supernatural. The problem here is the collapse between the human and the animal. There are similarities, but there's also differences, and he can't, he envies the differences. It's the problem of getting close to nature. Yes. So um, what he wants is just to not be a bird, but he wants the freeness of the bird. And like the... He wants the joy, the joy unperturbed of... by grief and, and a sense of mortality. Yeah. Mortality. Birds die. Are they aware yeah. that they're going to die? No. Maybe. Are they troubled by the fact that they're going to die? I don't think so. We don't get any signs of distress. There's no monuments to past birds. They don't have little tombstones. There's no sense of something that's been lost. Right? They, they, yeah. they don't have a moral awareness. Birds don't. And they have beauty. He, lo he longs for the beauty. He's troubled by his conscience. So he wants to live without fear. He wants to live like an animal. Not in the sense that he, he wants to escape mortality. Yeah. Now, poetry is a means to do that. It's a means of immortality. Other people will read his po poems and take delight in them, and they'll talk about John Keats, so it's a, he's in the, he exists in the memories of, of later individuals. But that doesn't solve his problem entirely. He wants more than that. He wants to be untroubled this is his by his humanity. Means of like letting that out. I think so. It's an expression of that. It's an expression of his longing as an artist. It's really a, romanticism is also connected with progressivism. So there's a belief that um, things are evolving and getting better and better. So in the early beginnings, it, we're almost a nothing. We're just if you think about Darwinism, which is not yet presented as a full-blown theory, but is 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 in the poetry of this period already. There's an early beginning in which we are some sort of primal muck and it develops into higher forms of life and eventually gets to us. And then we're moving on to the next stage, which is divinization. And the divinization happens through the imagination. So when they talk about creativity and imagination, it's a, it's a capacity to transcend oneself in poetry. So he, he envies the Nightingale sense of transcendence untroubled by death, and he longs for the same, but he's not capable of doing that because he has a sense of the loss of it. The contradiction to his own sense of divinity, that troubles him.
because the imagination for the romantics is almost a divine faculty and he uses it and yet he has not escaped his sense of his own mortality which contradicts that sense and that's what he's writing about very troubled by this trying to bring about a revolutionary poetics that will escape the humanity of the past and usher in the new age, the, a revolution in poetics. But he's still troubled by the fact that he knows his own mortality a, a, little, bit too, a little bit too nearly. He's seen other people die. So he's re referred to that there in the third stanza where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, maybe thinking about his brother, wasting away from tuberculosis, terrible coughing fits, lungs, blood being coughed up. Where but to think, he says, line 27, is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs. Thinking alone will lead the, to this state. The man, he's in ag anguish at the suffering of the world. Where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. So beauty is a, a real thing, but it's a fading thing. It, it changes just like a beautiful rose. The next day, it's starting to fade away. People are beautiful. Their beauty withers. They just, it just takes a little bit longer than a, a rose, but still, it doesn't. People don't look the same. They're get they're growing older. And he's troubled by this fact. It. Again, it contradicts his sense of transcendence, which is part of the natural world. This is part of the natural supernaturalism I, I spoke of, the sense of divinity in us. But it's still held back by the sense of nature, and nature connected most strongly with our sense of mortality and moral awareness of the problem of death. So back on to four. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his car parts. Now, the reference to Bacchus here. You know who Bacchus is? Yeah. Uh, Dionysus. Dionysus, so another nerve, yes. And he's often presented as having a, a, a leopards leading him onwards. He's also the wine god. Right, you'd referred to the wine earlier, now wine again. So he's gonna fly, he's tried to get, he's tried to get there through, you know, a few bottles of wine. That's, <laughs> let me try another way. On the viewless wings of poesy. Let's try it through poetry rather than through alcohol, through the imagination. What's the problem there? The dull brain perplexes and retards the, the material thing inside of his skull. That is, seems to prevent him from uh, transcendence, transcendence. It retards him. It holds him back. His poetry is going to be a disembodied sense of poetry. He's going to transcend that bodily confine. And yet poesy seems to be the expression of that transcendence. Now he imagines himself. Now, again, the colon comes here in the fourth stanza, but the colon is not giving an explanation of what came before. It's just to break the line, and now he imagines, I'm already with thee. Tender is the night, and happily the queen moon is on her throne clustered. He's probably thinking of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream here, which takes place in the forest, and there's the queen moon and queen Mab and this starry phase all around her, the fairies. An imaginary realm where the sight goes out, you can't see, and your imagination wakens. Just like when you're in the dark, you imagine all sorts of things when you hear noises. So the, the romantic poets tend to like the dark and things that are obscure because the, the sight, which is part of our bodily limitations, can be uh, transcended by our imagination. You, you can think about things that aren't there. Sometimes that might frighten you, but it has the advantage that you can transcend yourself. And now he, he goes on with that, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet. Now, if he was actually walking, he couldn't see them either. But he's, I think this, he's still imagining. Now what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, the incense that comes from a, 
a church service or a liturgy. It's a, the, the smell of the uh, prayers of the saints being expressed through that. Also used at funerals, of course, so it might have that resonance as well. But they're right upon the, the boughs in the forest, but in embalmed darkness even. Oh, now he's in the grave. Embalmed darkness. Guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild. White hawthorn, pastoral eglantine, and so forth. And the murmurous haunt of flies, all of the flies which come when, when uh, fruit and other things uh, start to decay. The flies gather and eat them up like scavengers. Imagining himself dead, remember he wanted death right at the outset. He's, he's thinking about his death, but he more than thinking about his death, he's thinking about transcendence, transcendence through poetry. And the death is of his senses now, but the part of him which transcends his senses, his imagination, is the part that he's really reflecting on. And darkling I listen. Now this word darkling is again Miltonic vocabulary. It's a poetic word. You won't find it outside of poetry. I think Milton use it, uses it in Lycidas. I believe that's where it was. Um, it's certainly Miltonic vocab I think Shakespeare uses it as well. So in the dark. I listen in the dark, and for many a time I've been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names and many amused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. While thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy, still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain. To thy high requiem become a sod. So now these, so this is a medit, the, the, the sixth stanza here is an extended meditation on death. He loves death, or he's half in love with death at any rate, calling him soft names as if he were a lover. Why? Because he'll kill the body. And the body's that part of himself which he wants to dissociate some. It's, a, it's an obstacle to his self-transcendence. But he's also not in pain. He's not sick. Whereas the bird that is singing is spoken to be singing in such an ecstasy. Now, this is interesting, this word ecstasy. These days, it's a drug. It's a reference to, to sex. Uh, often, but it, literally it means, it, it comes from uh, two words, the ecstasis, which is to stand outside oneself, transcend oneself, which is again his theme already. So it's an ecstasy, it's singing in a song of self-transcendence, which of course he envied right at the outset that it was the ability to stand outside of itself without any sense of contradiction, whereas he has the contradiction. And this is where it's going to lead him into a dilemma. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain. To thy high requiem, a requiem is what a uh, type of song that's per, uh, performed at funerals. Become a sod. He'll go back to the, to the, to the dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And the, the bird will still sing. It won't be the same bird, by the way, because even nightingales don't live that long. It's not. But effectively, what's the difference between one, one nightingale and the next? They're a species. They're not individuals. They're not persons. It's not that they don't matter at all, but they have no sense of the crime, almost, of death, the atrocity of death. For somebody who wishes to be transcendent, to be like a god, the idea that he should die is unthinkable. Finally, 
Thou was not born for death. Immortal bird. Divinizing the bird. What's the emperor's name? Seventh. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I heard, I hear this passing night, was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. From the highest to the lowest, they all heard the same song. Perhaps the self-same song that Ruth heard. Ruth, biblical Ruth. Mm -hmm. It could be exactly the same. Well, the song was the same. The song doesn't change. The nightingale does not change its song. It doesn't evolve. Whereas human beings in Keats's understanding, his evolutionary understanding, is they are evolving to something transcendent that transcends the bodily, whereas the bird remains the same. This is uh, its glory and also its problem for him because he still has the sense of mortality. Yes? So, from what I understand, I guess, his problem is he wants to be like the nightingale in that he wants to kind of... Be um, transcendent and, and... And contribute to this movement, I guess, as a figure that's not shown. But he also wants to be a great poet in that he won't be like the nightingale if there's the nightingale of the guys and there's just a bunch of them. Yeah. And none of them particularly stand out. So is that his problem, kind of that he wants to be this great poet, but also that goes against the movement itself? I'm not thinking. I'm not sure if he thinks of himself in terms of the movement here. He's more thinking about what poetry is. So he's not saying we romantics. They don't even call themselves romantics, by the way. It's a later designation. Mm -hmm. uh, but he does see it as the spirit of the age that mm -hmm. he is, uh, and the age of poets, which of which he is one. And, uh, and the problems for them is that they remain men, but they're, the poetry is about transcendence. And they can't escape their mortality at the same time. So they're on the, they're on the, on the verge, basically, of this new age of divinity, yet they're, they're sense that they're the dying, the last. They're the prophets of a new age, but they're not going to see the promised land. They're right there, but they're not allowed to see it. They can see it coming, they can sing about it, but they will not experience it. So that it could because it's an evolution, they're, but they're still men. And yet the poetry suggests a human transcendence, which is going to come, and it's clearly not his yet, because he... So his problem is he's not satisfied being just part of that. He's not satisfied just being a man, no. That's my sense. It's, it's a little bit complex, right? But I, I'm thinking that's it. And then at the end of this, he imagines it in, uh, in, in terms of the imagination, charmed magic casements, so the window frames, opening on the foam of a perilous sea in a fairy land, and then he hears this word forlorn, and it calls him back to himself. And at the end of it, he has questions. The anthem from the songbird fades away and now he's not sure was it a vision line 79 or a waking dream fled is that music the bird stopped singing do i wake or sleep was it the was the whole thing a dream an imaginative fancy did he ever actually hear the songbird he was conscious of it but was it just a meditation on an imagined song, or was it a real song? And is it, has he come out from his, woken up from that dream about a song, or did he actually hear a song? What's the difference? Well, he's, if he was sleeping, then it was a great dream about, and it was an imaginative experience rather than an actual experience. So it's a poetry about poetry, about the imagination, about the imagination, and so forth. It gets a little bit circular. Because again, it's about transcendence. So he wants to transcend the sense of limitation, and that's done through dreams. So in this age, they begin with what they do at a later stage in the 60s and so forth. They experiment with drugs um, for psych, you know, psychotropic medicine to to a, a, that experience of uh, that sensation of transcendence. They go on a trip. 
right, trip from themselves. Uh, it does actually happen in this period, and some uh, are consuming opium for the sake of pain, because they use opium, laudanum is what it's called, the derivative, and they use it as a painkiller. They don't, remember, they don't have anesthetics at this time, and people suffer pain then just as they do now. They, they would use laudanum to treat the symptoms of the pain, but then unfortunately suffered from addiction. <coughs> but a lot written about poetry and this sense <coughs> of um, the highs that come from this is similar to what poetry induces. Lots of reflection on that at any rate. Let's look at Ode on a Grecian Urn. So this is a very, it's a companion poem. It's written alongside it, probably directly after it. The occasion for this is probably worth mentioning. It is, uh, probably the occasion is Keats was, uh, went and saw the Elgin Marbles. The Elgin Marbles were named after Lord Elgin, who brought these um, statues and statuary and so forth from Greece, where the, they had been lying on the ground, being trampled upon and so forth. So great works of art, but were, I mean, the, the Greeks had been uh, under the uh, yoke of the Ottoman Turks for generations, and their culture lay under their feet, more or less. And Elgin went down to Greece uh, on an archaeological excavation, basically, and brought, brought the ba marbles back, and they sit to this day in the British Museum. So you can go see the Elgin marbles. And the idea was we want to rescue the art from its neglect. The Greeks want the Elgin marbles back. By the way, they've been arguing about it for 150 years. And the British say, well, you won't be able to take care of them. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So anyway, it's, I, I, if you're interested, just look up Elgin marbles and you'll see lots of arguments between the British and the Greeks about this. But the, he probably went and saw these marbles in the Pergamum Museum, and his friend, Benjamin Robert Hayden, was uh, the so-called high priest of eternal art, namely the type of Greek art that the uh, was represented in the Pergamum Museum. So the classical art as the most beautiful and most sublime art, most importantly. So Greek art is a type of classicism. But it's associated with sublimity in a way that Roman art is not. And the uh, Greek uh, German writer uh, Winkelmann talks about the silent grandeur of Greek art. German is gosh. German. Stille Größe. The silent grandeur of of Greek art. And it's sublimity, it gets associated with that. Remember, it's also in ruins. We talk about ruins in conjunction with uh, Wordsworth's uh, Tintern Abbey. You know, the, the ruin. But also, the, the, that's the work of the sublime power of nature on the most beautiful human art. In that case, a cathedral or an abbey, which is in ruins. And you can see nature has, the power of nature has destroyed what was once there. And the idea is evolutionary. It's leading to something that's better. What's better, nature, is, is more beautiful than any human artifice. But it's, again, a meditation on the relation between art and nature. So Ode on a Grecian Urn. And it's a response to Hayden, by the way, who was talking to Keats about how superior the Greek art was to the modern. Yes. Sorry, it's a response to who? Benjamin Robert Hayden was his friend's name. Okay. Who he would regularly, you know, chum around with was but where they were in disagreement about these matters. 
but a great deal of interest now in this period in Greek art in particular. Greek art was associated with sublimity in a way that Roman, Roman neoclassicism, the Greek, go, let's go back to the Greeks. The Greeks are more spontaneous and natural, it was said, than the Romans. The Romans were imitators of the Greeks, and imitation is never a good type of art according to the Romantics. You need to be spontaneous and original and natural. So let's go to the Greeks who came before the Romans. The Romans were copying the Greeks, forget the Romans. Let's go back to Greece, go back to nature. Now Keats is entirely in sympathy with that, but he is not in sympathy with the fact that anything that came before will be the mark and the measure of good art ever after. He thinks that there is a transcendent form of art that the imagination presents that is superior to what came before it. It expresses his evolutionary views. So let me read it first of all. So oh, an urn. What's an urn? I think we need to. Ashes, right, and ashes of a dead body. Okay, so it's a funeral vase, basically. Yeah, okay. And he's probably walking around it. So there are five stanzas here, and uh, there's, a, there's a gap between the stanzas, and it's a different scene. He's probably, if you've ever been to a museum where you would see it, or, and sometimes it's on a pillar or something, and you walk around it. So he's probably looking at one scene, and then he goes around to the next and just walking around it, and that's, I'm assuming at any rate. But here it goes. Now he begins it with a personification. And probably to, to some extent, an apostrophe. These are rhetorical figures. He, it's almost an invocation. He speaks of it as a thou, by the way. And the word thou is a very personal, intimate form. But he's speaking to a dead vo a, a vase that holds dead ashes. Thou, still unravished bride of quietness. Thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade. Though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high, sorrowful, and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O oh, mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer? lowing at the skies, with all her silken flanks with garlands dressed. What little town by river or seashore, or mountain built with perfect citadel, is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity cold pastoral when old age shall this generation waste thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours a friend to man to whom thou sayest beauty is truth truth 
beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. I should comment as well and to say that the final lines, oh, sorry, I didn't go down with this, but you have to listen to me this. These final lines, which are in quotations, here are in certain manuscripts, the quotation ends here. And, with, and if that is so, the comment that follows, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know, that's the poet saying it. Whereas here, if the quotation marks come after this, then it's the urn that says it, right? So there's a considerable, considerable discrepancy between the manuscripts, which changes the poem in important ways. But what's this poem about? Again, it's about art and the imagination and mortality. He begins by speaking to the muse, the muse, the urn, as if it were a person, and he associates it with, uh, with it, however, silence, which is interesting. It's a, an important emphasis in Wordsworth's poetry as well. Silence is a place where there is no sound, but also where uh, thoughts can transcend words. So again, the poetry of transcendence is expressed through the silence. And that's what he says here. So three sense of silence. Firstly, thou still unravished. You can read still in two ways. It's not yet ravished. It's still unravished, in which case it's a pleonasm, it's redundant, you don't need to say it at all, or he could talk to me about it, the fact that it's quiet. It's a quiet, unravished bride of quietness. There's a lot of quietness there. I don't know, but there's a, there's a, a it's called pleonasm, there's a redundancy in the word silence. There's a, it's a silent, silent, silent thing. And it's the foster child of silence in slow time. So it's not, like the urn looks more or less like it did thousands of years ago. It's been worn away a bit, but I don't know what state this particular urn is in. And yet he says that the tune, or the tale it expresses, is more sweet than his rhyme. His rhyme is in words. Where silence speaks more evocatively and more sweetly, is his word, than his poem. This is the claim that Hayden would make. So at first he greets it on the terms that Hayden would greet it as. This is the silent grandeur of Greek art speaks more beautifully than we can. Look at the grandeur. It's captured it in eternity, its eternal nature. And then he has questions for it, having heard that. What leaf fringe, fringe legend haunts about their shape? Now, legend has the, the meaning of uh, a story of the past, right? If you think of legends in that sense, right? A, an old story, a myth. Uh, if you take it more literally, the word la legend comes from uh, the Latin, and it means to be read. In the leaf fringe legend, maybe there are, there's a Latin script around the uh, circumference of the urn that he can't read. I don't know. Because he can't read Latin. I don't know. Or maybe because the words are now obscured by being worn down and so forth, or so forth. Or maybe he's talking about the whole picture, which he can't understand. Yes? Yeah, uh, well, it might have, yes. Well, the flowery tale, maybe, but leaf fringe legend, often you know that um, Greek art has the, around the, the border, it has leaves, like laurel leaves and so forth, and mm -hmm. so it could be that. This is the leaf fringe speaking. 
apparently the urn is speaking. The urn which uh, of death okay. <laughs> speaks on through the eternal art in which the death is inhabited. Um, or inhabits, yeah. rather. Is it the base speaking or could it be the only base speaker? He seems like he reads truth. Good. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> It is the beauty speaking, in fact. Just like in the, just like in the uh, nightingale. It, was the, it wasn't the nightingale per se that was speaking, because the nightingale, this nightingale, is the same as the nightingale that sung in generations past. So he's not really reflecting on the nightingale, but the nightingale's song, and not even on the song, but the beauty of the song. And here it's the beauty of the urn. Yes, so it is the beauty speaking. Yes? Does that mean he's speaking to the beauty? To some degree, he's addressing the beauty of the, and it's the, I, the sublimity is better than the beauty. So in the, in the period, um, the word sublime is connected with, with uh, transcendence. And that's really what's being associated with Greek art. It is a, a superior form of beauty. It's so superior that there's no comparison to anything natural. That's what's being claimed for it, actually. And Keats doesn't like that one little bit. I can't transcend that if it's superior. So there's a challenge there between the poet who claims to represent uh, revolutionary poetics and the dead, beautiful vase. But he has questions for it, and he interrogates it. What leaf fringe legend? Something I can't read. Is it here or here? What manner of gods are those? So you can see them portrait. What maidens loathe? So the women are running away. The nymphs are running away from the gods. And what are they doing? What's the pursuit, the struggle to escape? The pipes and the timbrels, what wild ecstasy? So that a scene of uh, nymphs or women fleeing gods who are trying to do what gods do with nymphs. No answer. There's, even though he speaks of it as a thou, it, it can't answer back. It's eternal, but it doesn't speak to a mortal in mortal terms. He comes back at it, has a second go at it. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. So he's still speaking sympathetically to the earth. It is superior, therefore ye soft pipes play on. Not to the sensual ear, but more endeared to the spirit. Ditties of no tone. So a ditty is a little song, but this is a song with no words and no tone furthermore. It's silence. So not to the sensual ear, but to the spirit, and the spirit not in sounds, but in silence. A silence which is a more beautiful sound than music. So he addresses various figures again, the youth, the lover, and the, the, the woman that he loves and the consolations of this, even though he can't actually ever get the girl, she will always be beautiful. She will never fade. You will always love her. She will always be fair. This is wonderful. There's the eternity side of it. But it doesn't, he's alienated from that. So it has eternity. It remains beautiful. There's no doubt about it or sublime. And, um, and this scene has been captured beautifully, but it, there's no change possible. It's fixed. And it's the fixity and uh, inability to change which makes Keats eventually going to, he's going to dismiss it. 